I want to just do a, a brief um, recap of why we did that. So really the point was is that very smart people disagree on how we can have a justified belief. Um, so we looked at uh, some potential positions that we might adopt, evidentialism, reformed epistemology, fideism. It wasn't necessarily to solve this debate. It's been ongoing for centuries, and it will continue to be ongoing with arguments being uh, presented on both sides. But the reason presented was twofold. First was to, I think, gain an understanding of where people are coming from. We do meet a lot of people um, that are influenced by evidentialism, even if they don't know it by that name. And so you may be having a discussion with someone uh, over God or LDS truth claims or whatnot, and the real debate might be actually about epistemology, right? You might actually be discussing what is good enough evidence. Um, and, and so it, it's really helpful to understand where people are coming from and what they expect to find in historical documents. And, and they, um, so that's the, the first thing. The, the second thing is just to understand that many people, many smart people, don't agree with evidentialism, and it's not necessarily required. So we, we decided that for purposes of these sessions, we would take a similar position to Reformed Epistemology. It's not exactly the same, so if you re end up reading Reformed Epistemology, this isn't exactly the same, but it's summarized nicely. Rational argument does not create belief, but it maintains a climate in which belief may flourish. That was kind of the quote that we used last time. Now, the way to think about this is that one's epistemology is very related to a burden of proof that they require for something to be quote unquote proven, right? So, whenever someone says this doesn't prove anything, again, we have to look at what are you, def how are you defining your epistemology? What, what is justified? Another way to think about that is what are you requiring as a burden of proof? In the US, we have many different burdens of proof. Most people have probably heard of this last one. Beyond a reasonable doubt, right? We, we use that one for cases like felonies where the consequences of a guilty verdict are very high. So we require a high burden of proof, right? It's often described in negative terms as a proof of having been met if there is no plausible reason to believe otherwise. That's how, sometimes how jury instructions will go for beyond a reasonable doubt. In a lot of other proceedings, we will use different burdens of proof starting with things like uh, burden of proof, some credible evidence. Sometimes this is used for stop and frisk type policies. Uh, substantial evidence means such relevant evidence as, reasonable, as a reasonable mind might accept as adequate to support a conclusion. Proponents of the evidence, this is where something is more, more likely than not to be true. So they, you would say it's above 50%. So another way to think of that, yeah, go ahead. Sorry, these steps of evidence here, um, do they come from somewhere? These are standard so burden of proof. Yeah, if you Googled burden of proof, you'd, okay. you could find them in every legal textbook. These are some of the major ones that we use in the U.S. So it's just another way to think about when, when, when we, that's why I don't really want to have debates on, did I prove this? Did we prove this? It all depends on what your burden of proof is, which really depends on your epistemology. If I were to kind of link these up, and this is very rough, but mapping someone's epistemology to what they would require as a burden of proof. Fideism might be none, right? In fact, it might be opposite. Any rational argument for God might be a, a negative to Phidias, right? They like to, they, they don't think ration uh, or reason should be involved at all. Evidentialism, roughly beyond a reasonable doubt, if not more, right? We see that they require things like, right, only a certain amount of evidence to be, uh, to be valid, things you can touch, things that are... Um, Encourageable, those type of things. So, very, very high standard, right? Reformed epistemology is roughly substantial evidence. So, in the in the context that we're discussing, the burden of proof really as truth claims is re, what is required to show by reasoning from historical documents and artifacts or other arguments might we might propose. So, if they're proved by a substantial evidence burden, such evidence as a reasonable mind might accept. I would argue that that is more than enough room for trust to flourish, right? That's our standard epistemology that we're going to use. So if we can prove things as to the relevant evidence as a reasonable mind might accept, that's more than enough room for us to trust um, religious experience, for example. So personally, I think the evidence currently available satisfies preponderance of the evidence, more than, more than that 50-50, but I actually don't think that that's 
required for belief to flourish. I don't think we have to meet a burden of proof of that level. But again, that it all is a personal, this is all really personal type decisions, what, what, um, what your epistemology and therefore what you require. Um, so you'll see most of my arguments are not, um, are not stated in a beyond a reasonable doubt format. They're more likely stated in a preponderance of the evidence or uh, substantial, um, substantial evidence. <coughs> so now we move right into the positive case. And we're going to talk about informal witnesses. Now, we all know the claim. Joseph Smith, plates of the appearance of gold. There's a picture of the hill. The box in which they found the place is a Joseph Smith, in which they lay, was formed by laying stones together in some kind of cement. In the bottom of the box were laid two stones crossways of the box, and on these stones lay the plates and the other things with them. Breastplate. Spectacles, what do you call them? The key sources, if you want to read more um, that we'll be using tonight, uh, this is a good book, From Darkness Unto Light. Um, really just comes out of Joseph Smith Papers. All the Joseph Smith Papers are available online at Joseph Smith Papers Project. They can be difficult to comb through because it's voluminous, there's lots of material. So this book really kind of streamlines the pertinent documents to this time frame. Uh, the other really key book is Investigating the Book of Mormon Witnesses by Richard Lloyd Anderson. He's been the uh, most involved scholar for the past 40-odd years in terms of researching and, and writing about um, Book of Mormon Witnesses. We have some other uh, minor sources here that we'll use um, throughout the presentation, which you can check out as well. So, Joseph kept the visits of Moroni... Kind of secret, for the most part. He said that the angel told him that they sh he shouldn't be telling these things abroad. Um, and that the reasoning for that is that people would want the plates for their monetary value. But inevitably, his family, uh, close friends find out, and pretty much everyone then in Palmyra finds out. It, it really does leak. So we're going to start with informal witnesses. There are friends, family, employers, um, people that become converts, essentially. Uh, Joseph Knight Sr., Newell Knight, both friends from Colesville, and Josiah Stowell, that was uh, his employer for a period of time, they actually heard of, of the plate, so they traveled to be at the Smith home at the night that he would go to get the plate. So Joseph and Emma actually borrow uh, their, his wagon to, to go up the hill to get the plates. So they're there. Of course, Joseph does not bring the plates home, right? Um, he hides them in, in a... Uh, called out law. But this is Joseph Knight Sr. Joseph Smith Jr. had talked with me and told me the conversation he had with the personage, which told him if he did, he would do right according to the will of God, he might obtain the plates the 22nd day of September next. And if not, he never would have them. It's an interesting piece of, uh, of conversation there that we don't typically get, that this maybe was Joseph's last chance, right? He had gone back for four years and been rebuked repeatedly um, because of his money digging past and his poorness, he had, he was uh, consumed for a, a time about the money he could make with the plates, and that was his big. What the angel told him was his big issue, and so this is a, the first we hear really of uh, the potential of him not actually getting them. So after retrieving the plates from their initial hiding place, and we're going to skip forward in our narrative. We'll move back actually and talk about um, uh, some folks that, that uh, were critics and tried to steal the plates, but we're going to. Since we want to stick with our theme of friends, family, employers, we're going to move forward. After he took him, brought him back from the initial hiding place, he's, he's assaulted three times, according to Joseph, on his way home. And this is what Catherine says, that when he came in, he was nearly exhausted. This is where the quote starts. Quote, he came in nearly exhausted, carrying the package of gold plates, clasped to his side with his left hand and arm, and his right hand was badly bruised. He apparently punched the third assailant very, very hard and actually injured his right hand in doing so. Joseph then handed the plates wrapped in linen through the house window to jo Josiah Stowell. So, so Stowell actually claimed that he was the first person that took the plates out of Joseph Smith's hands the morning he brought them in. So Stowell actually claims to be the first physical witness of the plates other than, uh, other than Joseph. We have further confirmation of this in the summer of 1830. Joseph is charged with disorderly conduct. We're not sure by who, neither different reports or Stowell's uh, nephew or son. 
But he's actually called as a witness by the defense, and he's sworn in. So Stowold testifies under oath that he saw the plates the day Joseph first brought them home. As Joseph passed them through the window, Stowell caught a glimpse of the plates as a portion of the linen was pulled back. So he actually gives a, the dimensions of the plates to the court and explained that they were cons- consist of gold leaves with characters written on each side. Yeah. So, so the disorderly conduct was about just that he was telling these stories? Disorderly conduct, he was charged for, um, there's a, there was a portion in the New York Code at the time that um, for anyone that claimed to see things and, and find mm-hmm. things, yeah. yeah. So, if they, but if they're talking about this is what it was about. This was not what it was about. Um, they were concerned. Stowell had hired Joseph. Um, Stowell thought he had found a silver mine near his property, and uh, Joseph had a reputation for being able to find things. So Stowell comes over. He's got a bunch of people digging for this mine, and Joseph actually, from what Stowell says in court, he describes Stowell's house to him without having seen it. The houses and the outhouses. And that convinces Stowell to hire him and uh, Joseph Smith Sr. They come down to dig for this mine. They do that for a couple months, um, and they stop unsuccessful like all of their money digging efforts. They, it was never a successful business for them. Um, but Stowell was a, a he liked Joseph. Um, he, he had no problem with him. So, it, but his nephew or son, we're not sure. Again, the court records are are sketchy. One of them is concerned that he's taking advantage of Stowell. So they bring the disorderly conduct charge. Catherine Smith, sister of Joseph, remembers seeing a package on the table containing the gold plates, but she picked up to judge the weight. This is a common occurrence of, of picking these things up, even though they were covered. She remembered that they were heavy like gold, and she, quote, rippled her fingers up the edge of the plates and felt that they were separate metal plates and heard the tinkle of sound that they made. William Smith, he's a teenager at this time. So he later wrote that he had, quote, hefted the plates as they lay on the table wrapped in an old frock or jacket in which Joseph had brought them home. He stated that he thumbed through the cloth and ascertained that they were thin sheets of some kind of metal, that I could tell that they were plates of some kind, that they were fastened together by rings running through the back. Very consistently, um, are both the weight, 40 to 60 pounds for most people that picked them up, and the rings, uh, D shaped ring similar to a three-ring binder of, of modern day. Alva Beeman, he's a friend, lifted the plates, felt the plates, and as you remember, they were hidden on the hearth for a portion of time. He actually helped do that and helped replace the, the hearth. He later, con- later converted and, and died in Utah. According to both Lucy Mack and Martin Harris, both Lucy Harris and her daughter were handed the plates uh, in a wooden box. And after, this is actually after night where she had been shown the plates in a dream. Martin said that his daughter said they were about as much as she could lift. His wife said they were very heavy. This, again, Martin sent Lucy and, and his daughter to interview the Smiths. He was very careful. We, we won't go into his story tonight, but um, he was the most, most skeptical of the uh, formal witnesses. Joseph Knight Sr. remembered that numerous locals came over hoping to see them, and when refused, this is where the persecution and abuse started of the Smiths. So they leave, as we know, they go to Harmony, to live uh, on, the, on the farm of, of Emma's parents. At that point, Joseph starts, stops hiding them. And so Emma remembers that they lay under our bed for a few months, but I never felt the liberty to look at them. The plates often lay on the table without any attempt at concealment, wrapped in a small linen tablecloth. Elizabeth III, her son, remembered she saw the plates in the sack, for they lay on the small table in their living room in the cabin on her father's farm, and she would lift them and move them when she swept and dusted the room. Even thumbed through the leaves, as, as does the leaves of a book, and they rustled with metallic sound. <laughs> Everything that we've covered now, as you'll notice, are very natural witnesses. It's picking them up, it's feeling them. There are also supernatural witnesses, or people that um, claimed experiences with supernatural people. So after Joseph and Emma's first child had died, this is after they had lost the first portion of the manuscript. So it's a very dark period in, in Joseph's life. So he'd lost his first son. Uh, the, everything's taken from him, the spectacles, the plates. They, of course, move up to the Whitmers. This put a lot of strain on the Whitmer family with uh, Joseph, Emma, Oliver coming in. So Mary Whitmer uh, tells David, her son, this. My mother was going to milk the cows when she was met out near the yard by an old man who said to her, You have been very faithful and diligent in your labors, but you are tried because of the increase in your toil. It is proper, therefore, that you should receive a witness that your faith may be strengthened. 
Thereupon he showed her the plates. She said that they were fastened with rings, thus, and in the manuscript she does the three, uh, kind of the D rings, I couldn't put that in here. He turned the leaves over. This was a satisfaction to her. After David's death, John C. Whitmer, her grandson, stated, I have heard my grandmother on several occasions uh, say on several occasions that she was shown the plates of the Book of Mormon by an holy angel, whom she always called Brother Nephi. I included that because that's an interesting uh, bit that we don't get in the, the more, extended period, uh, more extended account that was printed a month later. This is the full, ex- the full account. One evening, when after done her usual day's work in the house, she went to the barn to milk the cow. She met a stranger carrying something on his back that looked like a knapsack. At first, she was a little afraid of him. But when he spoke to her in a kind, friendly tone and began to explain to her the nature of the work which was going on in her house, she was filled with unexpressible joy and satisfaction. He then untied his knapsack and showed her a bundle of plates, which in size and appearance corresponded to the description subsequently given by the witnesses to the Book of Mormon. The strange person turned the leaves of the book plates over leaf after leaf and also showed her the engravings upon them, after which he told her to be patient and faithful in bearing the burden a little longer. He gives her promises that she'll reward will be sure, and then he disappears from, from when she could not tell. From that moment, my grandmother was enabled to perform her household duties with comparative ease, but no more inclination to murmur. He finishes, I know my grandmother to be a good, noble, and truthful woman. I have not the least doubt of her statement in regard to seeing the plates being strictly true. Luke Johnson, he was an early apostle, ended up uh, being excommunicated. I went to Joseph, Missouri. This is a, an account of, um, of John D. Lee in 1846. He said, I went to St. Joseph, Missouri. Well, there I met Luke Johnson, one of the witnesses to the Book of Mormon. Interesting use of that phrase. Uh, Brigham said many people were, had this similar experience. I had a curiosity to talk with him concerning the same. We took a walk down the river. I asked him if the statement he signed about seeing the angel on the plates was true. We don't have an extent record of this statement. We, we, don't, so we don't know where that went or, or what happened there. If he did see the plates from which the Book of Mormon was printed and translated, he said it was true. I then said, how is it that you have left the church? The angel appeared to you and you saw the plates. How can you now live out of the church? I understand you were one of the twelve apostles. I was one of the twelve, said he. I have not denied the truth of the Book of Mormon, but myself and several others were overtaken in fault at Kirtland. I have come to the conclusion that each man is accountable for his own sins. That uh, I intend to visit the saints and he has to visit the church. Darrell Pulsifer, he's a son of a Bunker Hill Revolutionary War veteran. After hearing of the gold bond in 1831 and meeting a missionary, never met Joseph Smith. He claimed that after praying, I thought I saw the angels with the Book of Mormon in their hands, and the attitude of showing it to me and saying, this is the great revelation of last days in which all things spoken of by the prophets must be fulfilled. There are converts, he baptizes many, including Wilford Woodruff, of course, goes on to be a president of the church, dies faithful in Utah. Harrison Burgess. Very similar story. This third Sabbath in May, while speaking to a congregation, I declared that I knew the Book of Mormon was true, the work of God. The next day, while I was laboring, something seemed to whisper to me, Do you know the Book of Mormon is true? My main mind became perplexed and darkened. I was so tormented in spirit that I left my work and retired into the woods, in misery and distress. I resolved to know whether I had proclaimed the truth or not, and commenced praying to, to the God of heaven for testimony. And all at once, my vision of my mind was open. A glorious personage clothed in white stood before me. Exhibited to my view the plates from which the Book of Mormon was taken. The stone box. This is really interesting. David Whitmer was initially um, skeptical of the rumor of the gold plates. What convinced David Whitmer was going to talk to the money diggers in Palmyra, who claimed to know where the box was located. He says, I had conversations with several young men who said that Joseph Smith certainly had golden plates. How do you know Joseph Smith has the plates? They replied, we saw the place in the hill that he took them out of just as he described it to us before he obtained them. Whitmer's convinced by these, uh, these people because they were so positive that they had seen the hole in the stone box. David told William, William Polson in 1878, it was a stone box and the stones looked to me as if they were cemented together, that it was on the side of the hill and a little down from the top. According to a reporter for both Chicago Sun-Times and then later in um, the Chicago Times, uh, Whitmer said that he had been to the hill three times, seen the casket that contained the tablets and the seer stone. Eventually, the casket had been washed down to the foot of the hill, but it was, it was to be seen when he last visited the historic place. 
So he said that they've seen Oliver Cowdery regarded the hill by Joseph Smith on one occasion, but they had seen that. Apparently, it was left exposed for decades. Uh, in 1893, an Edward Stevenson goes to Paul Myra and says that a local farmer showed him the stone box where it once was, and that large flat stones had been removed from the hole and rolled down and lay near the bottom of the hill, given in 1893. Now we get to informal witnesses that believe Joseph Smith had the plates that were not at all friendly to him. Uh, at that time, thieves, critics, other money digger uh, friends. Three are in particular feature in the story. Uh, Willard Chase, he was a local carpenter. He and Joseph used to, to dig together. Lumen Walter actually was a temporary convert for a time. And Samuel T. Lawrence, who was 20 years older than Joseph. We don't know a lot about Samuel, um, except that he was a known money digger of the time. Um, Joseph was on friendly terms with, with these guys for a period of time. He actually asked Willard twice to make him a, a case. He was a for the, for the plates, Willard refused probably because he didn't think Joseph could, could pay for it. Um, neither Samuel T. Lawrence or Joseph Smith left any statements about the relationship. A little odd because a mutual friend, Lorenzo Saunders, called his called him a very intimate acquaintance. Um, even in 1833, when we get the first um, truly anti-Mormon book, Eber D. Howe, of course, uh, in the book Mormon is Unveiled, uh, Velasquez Herbert, Herbert went to Palmyra to get a bunch of affidavits about, um, about Joseph Smith. Um, it named Samuel Lawrence, but does not include an affidavit from him. We found out, there's been some good research, found out he had moved by that time. So most of our information comes from Willard Chase. Uh, we assume they started out as friends and, and engaged in some money digging together. So, Bill Knight, what does he say about Lawrence? He said that he was a seer and been to the hill and knew about the things in the hill, and he was trying to obtain them. The night that Joseph goes to get the plates, he sends his father, Joseph Sr., to Lawrence's house. And Joseph and, um, and he wants to stop him from potentially ambushing him. So Knight remembers Joseph directing his father to, quote, Stay till near dark, and if he saw any signs of Lawrence's going, you tell him if I find him there, I will trash the stumps with him. So he was, <laughs> he was put under direction to keep Lawrence away. So Chase Lawrence, Walter, and then up to a dozen men tried to find Joseph's initial hiding spot for uh, the plates, which is in that, that hauled out log. They brought up um, a, uh, a guy with uh, the could use of magic, and they, they tried all sorts of, of things to, to find, the, uh, find the plates. At one point, they even bargained. So Joseph might remembers that Lawrence comes in to the house, accompanied by a rodsman, and wanted to talk with him. And he went to the West Room, and they proposed to go shares with him and tried every way to bargain with him, but could not. Then the rodsman took out his rods, held them up, and they pointed down to the hearth where they hid. It says, there it is under the hearth. So they actually moved the plates into uh, the barn up in the loft, which of course gets ransacked, but they don't find the loft, um, finally forcing them to, to move to, to Harmony. Um, so it seems these guys thought, because of their prior association, that they, maybe they were due the money from this treasure, that you know, it was, it was you know, owed to them for some reason. Um, to kind of wrap up Samuel T. Lawrence's story, he moves on with his life, does other things. His brother-in-law, Abner Cole, you might remember that name, he becomes one of the most vocal critics of the early church. After his Ironworks project failed, he starts the Reflector. If you ever um, you read the early uh, earliest accounts, actually, of the Book of Mormon, Abner Cole is printing um, from the press. He, he rented out the same press, Eber, uh, Grandin's press, where the Book of Mormon was published. And it was hanging there, and he starts publishing the Book of Mormon um, and, and portions of it, and making fun of it very early before it's even been published. Um, he becomes uh, one of the, the most vocal critics, and his brother-in-law. So most people think he got, he got some information from, from Samuel um, and kind of launched in, into that. So here's some conclusions. Um, ironically, the, the detractor Joe Smith, later on, they spent the remainder of his life claiming that he never found gold plates. But his initial problems that we've seen in 1827 came because everyone was certain that he had, and they were trying to get them from him. Um, we've also noticed two types of witnesses in terms of their experiences. One is natural, like we talked about, the lifting of the plates, the fingering the leaves, uh, those that had heard and believed and, or saw the stone box from where they were taken. All very natural phenomena and, and, and feeling type things. We've also seen supernatural Right? People that are shown the plates by non-mortals. This is 
this puts critics in a really interesting position, a really difficult position. Because if they wish to explain the two types of testimonies away, they have to resort to one of two things. Either a very large conspiracy, right? All of these people are, are getting together to, to promote this conspiracy. Or a combination of sincere hallucination, which is unlikely in and of itself, and deliberate insincere fabrication by the part of Joseph Smith. When we impeach witnesses in a court of law, we used to memorize this for our test, BIC. Bias, inconsistent statement, character, competency, contradiction. That's how you impeach a witness. The question is, can these witnesses be impeached? If you were to impeach their bum by bias, you would be arguing for a conspiracy. They're related to Joseph Smith, you could say. They're friends with him. They're all in this conspiracy together. If you're going to try and uh, impeach by inconsistent statement, by character, and by contradiction, those would all be conspiracy-type impeachments, right? They were faking things. They were lying, so we can catch them in an inconsistent statement, perhaps. Their character is such. Normally, in a court of law, you have to introduce testimony they've been convicted of a crime of moral turpitude or of um, untrustworthiness. Competency is one where you could, um, if you tried to impeach them, it would be based on hallucination. They weren't, um, right? They didn't understand. They were tricked. They were dupes, right? So in terms of how we can impeach them, these are pretty, those are, those are our options. Now, I have been unable to find extensive critical attempts to impeach the informal witnesses. Most of the attempts of impeachment are of the formal witnesses, for good reason. They're the ones who publish their, their accounts to the world um, and stood by them for the rest of their lives, and, and we'll, we'll deal with those. But most critics totally ignore them. Uh, Fawn Brody is significant in that she at least mentions one. She mentions... Um, uh, the Mary Whitmer story in her critically acclaimed book, No Man Knows My History. Um, her attempt to impeach is based on competency. So this is what she says. In an early age, he, Joseph, had what only the most gifted revivalist preachers could boast of, the talent for making men see vision. This was an aptitude unsuspected in himself. He didn't know he had this until the spring of 1829. She actually goes on to say that it's an unconscious ability. So she proposes that Joseph Smith had the unconscious ability to make men see visions. When was that book published? Uh, originally in 1949 and updated in 1970. People believe it? Uh, yes, it is. Uh, the Saturday Review distinguished in its viewpoint the richness and suppleness of its prose and its narrative power. Los Angeles Times, it's a significant contribution to understanding America's past. Right on Amazon. It is. There's been a number of there's a number of scholarship isn't great, but it's it, it is it remains well, the reason I use it not to poke fun, but it, it does remain um, one of the the most well known. It is the most well known non Mormon uh, autobiography or biography of Joseph Smith, the most well known, the most well respected, the most critically acclaimed. I mean, so I use it because because of that. Um, so what does he say about Miss Mrs. Whitmer's vision? It's probable that no one was more surprised at this than Joseph Smith, right? He can make the other men see visions, but Mother Whitmer had a vision on his behalf quite by herself. And Joseph doubtless pondered this miracle in his heart with wonder. I would say so. <laughs> I would ponder that as well. So Dan Vogel is a more recent. Um, he doesn't deal with the informal witnesses. He does deal with the formal ones. His argument is that the formal witnesses were alienated from empirical reality and had merely imagined the plates of the Book of Mormon, or seen them in a subjective hallucination. I think this is relevant because you have to apply that subjective hallucination to all these informal witnesses as well. If his uh, theory, and it ties directly into Brody's theory, um, these are hallucinatory uh, experiences that they would have to account for the informal witnesses as well. So we're going to walk through this argument, and... I'll present it again when we talk about the formal witnesses, but it's the same, the same argument. So we have documents for at least 14 informal witnesses that each claim that he or she felt the plates, weighing between 40 and 60 pounds, lifted the plates or were shown plates by angels. Proposition B, this is how we do formal arguments, right? Propositions and then therefore. So proposition B, it is improbable that Joseph Smith rendered these people incompetent, right? That's, that's how we would impeach them. Improbable that he rendered them incompetent by, quote, making them see visions, why? Because many occurred without Joseph Smith present, and 
There's no reasonable argument for how Joseph Smith kept a large group of people in vision for more than one and a half years. That's how long it had the plates, that they were ordinary part of people's lives, that they were lifted and hefted and felt and done all that. Um, I've seen no reasonable argument for his ability to do so. Uh, proposition C, many non-converts and non-friends tried to steal or bargain for the plates, obviously believing they had them. So therefore, our conclusion, it is reasonable, I would argue probable, that Joseph Smith, in fact, possessed plates, weighing between 40 and 60 pounds, as he claimed. Um, again, you'll notice the reasonable aspect, if, if the idea is to provide enough reasonable evidence for a, a person to uh, base their conclusion on, this would be one such argument. Another argument, number two. Sorry, Brett. Yeah. Um, does Brody give any other examples of <clears throat> people who <clears throat> sort of inspire others to see? He doesn't. Um, others, if you look up, you know, most others that hold to the hallucination of theory, mm -hmm. um, they actually say it's, it was, you know, he did it on, on purpose. She's the only one that I found that says it's an unconscious ability to make okay. men see vision. Others will say, you know, he took the three out and, you know, he, he made them look up. And then he put him under a trance. He hypnotized him. Sure. Um, she's the only one that I've seen that uh, claims some unconscious ability. She, like I said, it doesn't go into it. I mean, when you read it first time and you have to like, pause, you're like, what? You know, like, because mm -hmm. there's just not, there's no there there in terms of, she kind of moves on quickly. But people generally move on quickly from the witnesses. They're hard to deal with, in my opinion. They're, you have to, again, you got a massive fraud, right? Or it's this... Um, You've got this ability to make people see visions, which is, I think, very hard to provide a reasonable <laughs> argument for. There's no examples of him mis like me messing up, right? You know, people that are learning, magicians that are learning to put people under hypnosis, they'll mess up. There, there's no evidence for him training, for him messing up at times. And then the witnesses will go through the formal ones, even the informal ones, right? They keep it for their whole life. And normally you go under hypnosis, you understand that's maybe a different type of thing. Um, again, you have to go different times and over a period of 1.5 years, it's, I think it's a difficult, um, difficult argument. So, Brad, none of those 14 informal witnesses? No. Nobody's writing. Uh, I, I've been only been extended, no, I, 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 they, they normally ignore. Yeah, James Strange, lawyer, um, like all good people. Um, briefly associated, we can go in, if that's a question, we can go through the Strange um, whole saga. Briefly uh, affiliated with the LDS Church, then um, brings witnesses and digs up plates where he has, um, you know, that he claims to translate. Um, no supernatural witnesses, and the witnesses very quickly, uh, most of them recant in terms of the natural witnesses. That's well, He had natural witnesses that saw him. He, up dig him up, he brought him to the spot and they, they dug him up. Most of the ones we covered here didn't get, you know, Mary Whitmer gets to see them uh, and the angel will show them, but they're not like the 11 where they get to handle them fully and look it up for themselves. Um, so most of them are hefting, fingering, um, you know, those type of things, but they don't get a fully examined like the formal witnesses. So, um, and again, if there's questions on the strange, we, we can definitely, definitely go through that. Um, so the second, uh, second argument is a, a form of reduction to the absurd, reductio absurdum. I've titled this, I, I'm going to trademark it, the metallurgical fraud plus mass and extended time and place hallucination theory. For <laughs> lack of a better, wow. lack of a better term. So this is this is argument number two. Joseph Smith is either a fraud or he got the got the plates as described. I don't think there's necessarily an argument uh, for that. He either did or didn't have the plates as, as described. Proposition B: If Joseph is a fraud, the following list of people must be co-conspirators or dupes. Um, co-conspirators slash hallucination, uh, right? So. They're either conspiring with Joseph or they're duped. And for th this group of people, it's in a number of things. It's in, tr in translation of the plates. So all these um, were witnesses to the actual translation. 
It's the sword, the director, the spectacles, and the angel, right? So Joseph doesn't have to just produce if he's he's duping them. For example, if he made up made his own, for example, he has to make up um, a lot of other ancient artifacts as well. So this, of course, includes your um, Joseph and your formal witnesses, which we'll go through later. Uh, Co-conspirators or dupes that had full view of the plates include, of course, your your formal witnesses, and then as we've been through, um, the angel, Thyra Mary, Harrison Burgess, Luke Johnson, maybe others. So this also requires hallucination because it's supernatural in nature, right? Uh, the natural ones you could you could dupe by uh, the metallurgical fraud, excuse me, but these ones would it's on angels, so require some some seeing of visions. Co conspirators dupes for breastplate and spectacles. Uh, Lucy also saw those. Co conspirators dupes for plates who saw the covered, felt the weight lifted. Uh, William Smith, who we went through, Sophronia, Lucy Harrison's father. Catherine Smith, who we went through, Newell Knight, Josiah Stolwell, Joseph Knight Sr., Alba Beeman. Now, since all translation witnesses, this is uh, C, since all translation witnesses record dictation without the use of any materials, any witness that also has a view of translation must be a co-conspirator. Does that make sense? Why C would be be true? All of these witnesses were just of translation. So Samuel H., Reuben Hale, uh, Emma's brother, and Emma. Uh, they were witnesses to the translation where he does not ever have anything with him. So they, they describe it as dictation, and we'll go through that as well. But because of that, um, they must be a co-conspirator. They must be, right, he either had those things to help him write the Book of Mormon or he's dictating it. So they either have to be in on it with him, again, or they're still under some type of hypnosis. The only current hypothesis, Brody Vogel, makes no attempt to prove conspiracy. I think it's really hard for people to prove conspiracy because of the length of these people's lives. And when you read them, and we'll go through even more of the formal witnesses, um, what you get is sincerity and consistency through their lives, even though they leave the church and have different theological leanings at times, and Joseph Smith calls them names, and it, it, you know it, they never they never recant. And I think that's part of the reason why it's very hard to prove conspiracy. They didn't get anything out of it, but bad things. Um, so no, I haven't seen any recent attempts or current attempts that try to prove conspiracy. So they all rely on this um, on this uh, mass mass hypnosis type stuff. So the, if Joseph is a fraud. He has to, one, create extensive metallurgical fraud to dupe 22 natural witnesses, as well as induce at least 10 people, so massive hallucination that extended for months, all throughout the dictation of the Book of Mormon, and into places where he's not present, in some cases for people he had not met. Those are fraud. He has to do both of those things to dupe and or hallucinate people. My... The next proposition is that it's highly improbable that Joseph Smith could have accomplished, oh, I had C, I added one, accomplished E. I think it's highly improbable that he could have done that. Therefore, it's reasonable or probable that Joseph Smith possessed plates, as he claimed. So what we did here is we reasoned to the absurd. That's reductio ad absurd. We, we, we set up a proposition that he was either, uh, it was either as it, as it happened or was a fraud, and we assumed that it was a fraud. And then we tried to prove that that was absurd, which we didn't prove fully absurd, but we proved, or I tried to show that it would be um, highly improbable for him to accomplish these two tasks. That's the second, um, the second argument. Questions? Later on, regarding Book Mormon, are we going to talk about some of the content that people have had? We are going to have lots of fun with the Book of Mormon. Um, we'll go through, actually, we'll, we'll reread the Book of Mormon with the help of some great scholarship that um, will we'll deal with correspondences and also with some of the problems that people have had. Yeah. This is... Uh, we can do. We, we'll do. We're going to do a segment on on the translation, and um, we'll go through 
there's loose translation, there's, there's different theories of translation, but, but you're correct. Joseph never claimed to know the characters and know how to know quote-unquote Reformed Egyptian. So it's not a translation, it never is claimed to be in the sense that we think of translation, where the translator is looking at one language and he knows both languages, right? We'll go, we'll go through that. I think, number one, because of this. I think um, producing something out of quote-unquote thin air um, is harder to prove. I think God is concerned about, about the evidence and the proof that he's provided. He's concerned about witnesses. So I think this is a, a major reason. Uh, they, they existed. If they existed, they were real. And, and we'll, we'll talk about how Joseph worked with them, though, and he We'll talk about how, you know, he tried to get him translated. That's why he sent, sent Martin Harris to, to Anthon and to, uh, to other scholars. Joseph actually, originally, we think he assumes that his role is more to get the plates and get them translated, like get someone else to translate them. Um, after the Anthon incident is when he really starts to go, okay, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to do this, and he starts to try and figure it out. So he works with the plates for a number of months and copies characters and, and tries to figure things out on his own. Um, so, I don't think you need anything. I, I don't know. I, I, I don't know. Yeah. No, no. I, I, I don't think they're negative. I, I, I don't think they're negative. I don't think you could make them negative. Like I said, if the plates existed, and that's all I care about, right? If they happen, <laughs> if a portion happens to the seal, I, that doesn't really matter, right? Again. In terms of LDS truth claims, what do we care about? Joseph Smith had plates for a period of time. He trans- translated those in some way to what we have as, as the Book of Mormon. That's what we care about. Sealed, unsealed, all that, you know, that, that has no bearing on whether he had plates. There's lots of there's actually lots of examples anciently uh, which we can go through of, of books with portions of them sealed. Um, so it was an ancient practice. To... Probably nothing, but the Nephi. Yeah, mine might not have been sealed for Joseph or us. It might have been something that Mormon and Moroni were doing because, like you said, that's what they do. I don't want my kids to read this part. <laughs> yeah, I don't know. There, there, there isn't much. There isn't much. You know, there isn't there isn't much discussion there by Joseph or anyone else in, in terms of you know, why why they were sealed. He obviously didn't even attempt to you know to look at that. Um, and again, there's there was never any intimation that he somehow knew that language. So the idea of it ever being a translation as we term that is knowing both languages and and, and putting it that that was never on the table. Never claimed to have learned the language. So. What does he say about other Yeah, we can actually go through tons of examples. You know, the first book that we have um, is actually written on 24 karat gold. Um, the first writing on metal that we found. Um, and then there are examples of seals, sealed portions. There are examples of hiding them, you know, from Ron. They're hiding them in caves and in boxes. Like, so, you know... Again, as, in terms of evidences, um, none of that is new. None of that is new. On gold or steel. It's, We've seen that in other. It's only new. It was new back then, and uh, back when Joseph proposed the idea. So, if I show you some quotes where people are um, dismissing the Book of Mormon because of the method, because it was on plates, which I can show you right here. Um, it, it was it was not known. It was known in some small quarters of academia that um, ancients wrote on plates and, and buried them. So it's, it partly goes into again this idiot savant theory. If he's if he's creating this on his own and he figures that out, he has to go get access to these obscure journals that generally people don't don't have, right? Um, but then of course he has to be stupid enough to put. Stealing horses. So um, it's <laughs> it, 
when you when you go down this road of, of him creating it, right, he has to have, we, we'll go through all the, in one of the lessons, we'll go through all the material that he should have had or needed to have to produce it according to critic. And, um, and we'll see again, is that, is that reasonable? Is that probable that, that he could have done so? Um, in, a, in a hidden book, there's a, a whole book. If you're interested in diving right into this, um, uh, Vedness put together, uh, it's actually available, I think, free online now, called The Hidden Book. Uh, and he goes through all of these from front to back in terms of um, ancient documents and written on plates and how they hid them. Um, here's what, but you're right. In Joseph's day, M.T. Lamb says, no such records were ever engraved upon gold plates or any other plates in the early ages. Right? So if we're having this class in the 1840s, the first thing, one of the first things we have to deal with is an anachronism, as a crazy idea, is that we've got plates that are engraved upon. You notice today, that's not what the critics think. Right? That, that's not, a, not one of the major concerns. Why? Well, it's been dealt with, but... It's part of this process that we've had over the, of the years of the Book of Mormon becoming more and more probable. And as these objections fall off the map, we rarely get credit for that, quite frankly, right? I, I have yet to see the, the critics say, hey, I know we criticized you back then, but you guys got us on this one, right? Um, Stuart Martin, writing in 1920, says that no one pointed out to young Joseph that gold would corrode if left buried for so long, ridiculing the concept of preserving a text on buried gold plates. Book of Mormon reports have been originally engraved. This is Roy Sunderland in a pamphlet. Mormon is exposed and refuted in 1838. Which are originally engraved on brass plates. How could brass be written on? This book speaks of the Jewish scriptures having been kept on kept by Jews on plates of brass 600 years before Christ. The Jews never kept any of their records on brass. Yeah. 1857, mainly in the old world where they came from Mesopotamia. We don't find it in the new world. And people will point out we didn't find a new world in, well, that doesn't really bear on the argument since these people brought it with them from the old. 1857, John Hyde Jr. specifically argued that the idea of ancient Hebrews writing on metal plates was implausible. He said, The plates, remember, is Hebrew youth who has lived all Jerusalem all his days. Now, the Jews did not use plates of brass at the time. The writings are tablets, or wax, linen rub, parchment. It's another strong proof of imposture. Right? So, um, now this is a non, non-Mormon it is cited by Tvednes, but the idea that sacred texts were originally inscribed in metal tablets recurs in the Mormon belief that the Book of Mormon came down inscribed on gold plates. Important documents were in fact preserved on metal tablets and preserved in stone or mobile boxes in Mesopotamia, Egypt, etc. And Tvednes, like I said, there's a whole book where he walks through example after example after example. So, um, we would have a different class in 1830 as we have now in terms of what is deemed out of place and what is deemed crazy. This is one of those things that... Um, isn't anymore, so we rarely deal with it. But um, again, if Joseph uh, Joseph made this up and he got this right, um, hard to do. So anyway, like I said, there's a whole book if you want access online. Perhaps 50 things about ancient records that must be hilariously 30 minutes purpose since today. Essentially hiding books, all kinds of containers, including some boxes, ceramic jars. But. All right, we're right on time. 9.30. Go. Say a prayer for us, bro. Yeah.